Welcome to Talk About Talk with Dr. Andrea. In this podcast, we will learn about all things communication. Listen as Dr. Andrea and the experts she interviews share their expertise. Let's do this. Let's talk about talk. Hey there. Welcome to Talk About Talk. I'm Dr. Andrea Wojnicki. You can call me Andrea. Today, we focus on storytelling. We've all heard that great communicators are also great storytellers, right? I thought it would be a good idea to learn a little bit about storytelling. The stories we read, the stories we hear, and the ones we tell. And then there are the stories that are implicit or hidden in our day-to-day activities. In the news, in gossip, in advertising, and in our relationships. For this episode, I interviewed Harvard Business School professor and author Gerald Zaltman. If you want to connect with him or reference any of the books or the research that we cover, you can find it all in the show notes under the podcast tab at talkabouttalk.com. All right, let's do this. When I first spoke with Jerry about this topic and the interview, he was very enthusiastic and supportive. He said, and I quote, you're absolutely correct in highlighting the importance of story. That's how we live our lives. That's how we understand the world around us. That's what a theory is. That's what an explanation is. That's what a relationship is. Okay, let's back up. Do you remember when you were in grade school learning how to write a good short story? Do you recall what the five key elements are of a story? I bet you can get most of them off the top of your head. They are theme, setting, plot, conflict, and character. First, the theme is what weaves the story together. It's the central idea or belief. It's often a statement about society or about human nature. The setting is the where and the when that the story takes place, the location and the time period. The plot is the series of events and actions associated with the conflict. And conflicts. Well, there are three main types of storyline conflicts. Man versus himself, man versus nature, and man versus man. That could be man versus an individual or versus society. And the last element is character. Almost all characters in stories are archetypes or personalities that are commonly understood. Think hero, villain, sage, pauper. These archetypes appear in novels, fairy tales, movies, advertising, and yes, in everyday life. Consider the hero myth. Typically, this character has an unusual birth, has a great man or God as his father, and qualities of greatness himself. He is sent into exile or danger, and the hero typically passes a test and eventually saves the day. Think Superman. Think Rocky. Think Finding Nemo. In one of Jerry's books, he highlights that the typical female archetype is either a nurturer, a witch, or a prostitute. What? Jerry's not advocating for these roles for women. He's merely reporting his observation. In the interview, I ask him whether these archetypes may change as women gain more status and as the hashtag MeToo movement gains momentum. As usual, Jerry's answer is not at all what I was expecting. But I'm sure he's right. This man has a way of making me think differently. You'll see what I mean in a minute. In his book, How Customers Think, Jerry says that the fusion of memory metaphor, and story enables consumers, or anyone really, to create meaning. Note the concepts of both memory and metaphor here in the context of storytelling. First, a note on memory. Let me highlight that the similarity of story and store or storage, as in storing memories, is no accident. Stories are a way of storing memories in our minds and amongst our people over time. Stories are part of our episodic memory. We have two kinds of memory, semantic and episodic. Semantic memory is about general facts and knowledge, like, say, hockey is a sport with skates and sticks and pucks. Episodic memory, on the other hand, consists of personal facts, experiences, and stories, like maybe the story of what happened at the hockey game last week. What about metaphors? 
As you probably recall from English class, a metaphor is a figure of speech that, for rhetorical effect, directly refers to one thing by mentioning another. It may provide clarity or identify hidden similarities between two ideas. Apparently, in English, we use about six metaphors in one minute of speech, or ten or more for every 25 words we speak. So almost half of what we say is a metaphor? Really? Metaphors are used in many, perhaps most, stories. What about myths? And what is the difference between a story and a myth? Well, myths are a certain type of story that serves to pass down the wisdom of ancestors. Wisdom as in instructing people how to act. Some modern myths include safe sex, political correctness, and the new man. All of these myths tell us how to act. Then there are memes. A meme is an element of culture that is transmitted. Recently with social media, the term meme has come to refer to an image, video, piece of text, or something else that is copied, often with slight variations, and then spread rapidly over the internet. Wait, is a meme a story? Well, it certainly can be. Okay, here's the question that I really want an answer to. What makes for the best stories? Trust me, there are as many answers to that question as there are memes in your social media feed. Beyond the basics, think character development, tension, conflict, there really is no one single formula. If there was an answer, then all of the books we read and the movies we see would be phenomenal. Based on the research that I did, and based on my conversation with Jerry Zaltman, here's what I think about the best stories, the ones that resonate or engage us. First, the best stories are the ones that surprise or astonish us in some way. They deliver the unexpected. Two, great stories are the ones that leave a little bit up to the reader or to the audience to fill in. You'll hear more about this from Jerry. And last, the best stories are the ones that challenge our assumptions and our beliefs. So it's not just the character that's experiencing tension, but the reader or the audience as well. Now, let me introduce Professor Gerald Zolman. As I'm sure you will deduce from the interview, I absolutely adore Jerry. He is one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. Jerry is Professor Emeritus at Harvard Business School and co-founder of the firm Olson Zaltman. He's internationally known for engaging students, colleagues, and clients in the art and science of thinking. His work focuses on marketing, sociology, innovation, social change, the representation of thought in terms of metaphors and storytelling, and more. Over the years, he has secured several patents and published many, many books. So yes, he is a very smart man. What is unique about Jerry, though, is the generosity of his intellectual engagement. He inspires us all to think. His most recent book, entitled Unlocked, Keys to Improve Your Thinking, which you will hear about in a moment, challenges readers to be more conscious of their thoughts. Consistent with this goal of helping people to think more clearly and productively, he is generously offering a book-matching donation program with this book. Please see the show notes for this episode on the talkabouttalk.com website for details and links so that you can help him help others. Just a few weeks ago, Jerry was awarded the prestigious American Marketing Association's Consumer Behavior Interest Group Lifetime Achievement Award for extraordinary academic and service contributions. Well deserved. Outside of all of this academic work, Jerry also enjoys street photography, swimming, and fishing in Alaska. It is my honor to have you here, Jerry. Let's get into it. So I know that you've written over 20 books. I think it's 23. Is that right? That sounds about right. Okay. So you've covered some themes in your books, such as consumer research, metaphors, consumer psychology, but your most recent book, entitled Unlocked, Keys to Improve Your Thinking is a little bit different, right? Maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about the book and why you wrote it. Okay. It didn't start out as a book uh, per se. I didn't plan to write this book. The way it began is about two, three years ago, I began to worry a lot about the information world that my grandkids were growing up in, uh, a world that we now call fake news or a period of truth decay. 
especially a period of time where opinion seems to determine fact, what we accept as a fact, as opposed to a fact determining what our opinions might be. And as I thought about that problem for them and began writing little exercises to sensitize them to the problem in conversation, I began to appreciate more and more that so much of our attention in daily life goes to what we think. By comparison or in comparison, we give relatively little attention to how we think, to the forces of various complex and often hidden forces that determine what what it is we think. Um, And I have some explanations for that. But I was concerned increasingly that uh, these young adults were not being instructed much in terms of how they think. They were being given things to think about, but not the all-important factor of how they get there, how they arrive at it. So I would do these exercises and, you know, share them in writing or verbally, as I, as I mentioned, with them at different times. And as friends and colleagues began to hear about what I was doing, um, they started encouraging me to write a book for people of all ages, kids of all ages, as it were. And it turns out that so many of the exercises I, I re- present in the book are actually ones I've used with executives, with MBA students, and I began to appreciate more and more how how, uh, how much thirst that there is for reflecting inward about how you think, not just what you think. Right, so it's like a different level of, of consciousness. You have the what versus the how. It's almost like a meta-consciousness of what's going on between your ears. Exactly. I think so much of how we think is largely unconscious and we're only aware of the product that is what we think when we're actively reflecting uh, or speaking, uh, talking about what we think. And that's a little late in the game (laughs) to... uh, to be exercising quality control over the content of thought. I love that. Quality control over the quality of our thought. The only example that I can really think of that's occurred in the marketplace, you know, in terms of books or other material that encourages this level of thinking is a while ago, there were a lot of books being published by economists about heuristics. And then more recently, and even in, you know, the current culture of fake news, etc., as you mentioned, People are complaining about it, but they're not doing anything about it. So I applaud you for doing something about it. Well, do you know, part of the the challenge is because how we think is, is largely invisible to us, it's a little scary to go there and to probe that. The picture we might see isn't always, you know, the picture we would like to see. We might find ourselves more often than we would like to think using opinion as a a screening device for what is a fact and changing uh, what we think of a fact based on how much we like uh, the origin of the fact. I appreciate you um, offering the what you're thinking about versus how you're thinking idea as a kind of a way of summarizing the approach in the book. It makes me think about what I'm trying to do with the Talk About Talk podcast. My objective with Talk About Talk was to educate myself and listeners about how we can talk and communicate more effectively. And I'm, I'm thinking about that in a more disciplined way after having read your book, because you've, you're focusing on the thinking about thinking, and I'm focusing on the talking about talking. So it just uh, works so well. And I, again, I thank you for that. I, you know, when we spoke a, a, a while back about the issue of talk about talk, um, 
I hadn't really framed it in this way initially. And then as I started thinking as a result of that conversation many, many weeks ago, uh, I began to see the task in a very different way, in a very fun way. I see writing as a way of learning, figuring out what it is I'm thinking about and how I'm thinking of something. And I think, had I thought about it in time, it, it really talk and writing are interchangeable for that function. How often do you get asked something and you don't know you have an opinion or a judgment or a position until you start talking about it? Exactly. And how often in the course of a day do we say things like, well, what I really mean is, no, no, I take that back, or let me rephrase that. It's, it's the equivalent of uh, crossing out lines of text that you've written. Right, and another example, I've been in conversation that a person will say, I have a question for you, and then I lay out options or a scenario with different options, and then I say, I'm answering my own question just through articulating yes. it to yep. you. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. So I think talk and writing have an equivalency in, in many respects, um, particularly as a mode of discovery of how one is thinking and what the content of those thoughts are. Right. And then with, with speaking in particular, you're over, you have a, more than just words, right? In terms of the communication, you're overlaying tone and volume and cadence. Whereas if it's written, it's, you have the font and the words to play with. Right. And so both uh, are a way of ident learning your own identity, I think, who you are. It's sort of a self-discovery, as it were. Jerry, you've had an influence on me, obviously. While you're, while you're writing about thinking about thinking, I'm starting a podcast about talking about talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's definitely a link there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it, it may be totally overlapping. There's not something to be linked. They're one and the same. So if you don't mind now, I'd love to move on to storytelling. Let's start by talking about storytelling at a very general level. The question is, what makes for a great story? One element of a great story is that it activates the imagination. Now, what I mean by imagination is filling in that which is missing. That's what imaginations do. They create something that was previously absent. So a story helps you do that, but it only does so if it's really an effective story, a powerful story. What a good, really good story needs to do is allow the person engaging the story, reading it, watching it, thinking about it, to engage in what I call or think of as co-creation. Okay. Wh whoever the author is, whether it's a... a the creator of an ad, a traditional author, a musician, it doesn't really matter. What they have to do is provide just enough material to enable you and to enable me to fill in the missing pieces. And what you will do and I will do is fill them in probably differently, but in a way that is especially meaningful to each of us. So we might both walk away from engaging the same story, think it was wonderful, but then discover we think it's wonderful for very different reasons. Well, that certainly happens to me when I'm in book club. Even two women who adore a novel will have very different interpretations. Exactly. And that, that's, that's, I think, so essential for any, any kind of um, story production, no matter what form it takes, is it allows a co-participation, sort of a co-authorship of the story in a way that is personally meaningful. Right. So an author or a musician or a 
marketing agency shouldn't and really can't assume that they're dealing with an audience or a reader who has a blank slate? Absolutely not. They don't have a blank slate. So do you think that the best storytellers are the ones who challenge the assumptions that are associated with that non-blank slate? Are they the ones that are not just providing the details to fill in the missing pieces, as you said, but actually challenging what their assumptions may already be? Yes. And I think there's an artful way of challenging those assumptions. Probably want to be careful not to challenge too many assumptions that are very firmly held. People will just dismiss what the story is unrealistic, implausible, wrong. There's a middle ground of assumption challenging that causes us to say, gee, that's interesting. They're not strongly, devoutly held, and they're not weakly held or ones that we don't really care much about. There's a mid-ground of assumptions that you have to engage and question. So a moderate assumption is one where all else equal, this is where I stand, but I'm open to new information that could change my attitude. Yes, yeah. You're not going to dismiss the person as being absurd or obvious by challenging that assumption. With all of this talk about stories, it's also fascinating, I think, at a meta level, because we all think we know about stories because we've been read to since probably before we could talk, and then we learned to read, and we've all been reading stories ever since. You know, I did some basic research on, on stories and storytelling, and there's so much out there to learn about stories. Well, s- stories are relevant even before we're read to us as infant, child, children. Um, I think all of our information gets organized according to stories. Memory itself, it, it's argued, is story-based. And if you wonder about that, just think of a situation where a group of people are together telling jokes. And one person tells a joke and another person says, oh, that reminds me of the story about. <laughs> it, it, it triggers a memory. This, the, the second story may be far-fetched or far away, but um, that's the way we organize our memories. When someone's talking about an episode in their life, it'll trigger an episode, a story in your own life. That reminds me, I believe it was in your book, How Customers Think, you talk about how there's no accident here that the root of the word story and store or storage, as in storing memories, is there's a link there, right? It's That's exactly correct, yes. I was thinking about the quote or the euphemism that people often use, like, well, that's quite a story, and that means really it's a lie. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you, yeah. It, it's also it, it's a it, it's a question of tonality whether that's meant as a, num- a statement of disbelief or total acceptance. That's true. That's true. And so you said, I have quite a story for you. It could be just something that seems implausible, but it in fact is true. Right. And the person will just say it almost in an admiring sense, wow, that's quite a story. Or we might just say, okay, what's your story? (laughs) Or what's your side of the story? And showing there's a little skepticism expected. Sounds like something in a court of law. Your side of the story, my side of the story. We're both telling the truth, but the stories are different. Have you ever seen the Japanese film Rashomon? Nope. It's a story about a rape that takes place. And there are people who observe it from different vantage points. And they each tell the story of the rape. And the stories don't correlate at all, really. And each one is a very authentic version of the story. It's just a wonderful film. Interesting. I will put up a link to that in the show notes. So let's shift then into marketing, um, which is the focus of many of the 23 books that you've written. Can you 
share how storytelling is essential to or a part of marketing? Well, to begin with, what do marketers try to do? They try, or at least in some of their activities, is to create um, consumption experiences. And a consumption experience is a story. Uh, it may be an uninteresting story or a, a boring one, a short one, or a very engaged one. You want to enhance the experience of a client. And that is to enable them to envision a new experience that they could have, which involves creating a story around a product they may not have tried before. But be before they'll try it, they have to do a dress rehearsal in their mind. There's a script that gets written, as it were, that precedes the purchase of a new product. And what a marketer wants to do is influence that script. So I think storytelling is central to all marketing. But I remember doing a project. I won't mention the company. It was, you know, a soft drink. And what we were doing were, were having people tell us stories that involved secrets regarding the product. And it was amazing the kinds of secrets that people talked about in which the product, the soft drink, was a prop, an element. One story, as I recall, was about a little girl who would meet once a week with her grandfather to share uh, a treat. And the secret was that while she would have an ice cream, he would drink this beverage, which he was forbidden to drink for some dietary reason. But it was their secret that he would indulge in this beverage that he was forbidden by his <laughs> by others in the family. And this was a, a, not a girl telling us, this was an adult relating this experience as a child. But it was a, a story, really, involving a secret that had a huge impact on this woman. Uh, and ideally, that's what, what marketing wants to do. It wants to create a bonded experience in which the product may be simply a prop, you know, a minor party in it, but nevertheless is a very significant marker or signal of an emotionally deeply entrenched set of um, experiences. As you were describing storytelling and marketing, I was thinking about the, the whole if-then structure of, of storytelling that we do in our minds, right? So if I drink this um, beverage or, you know, if I buy this certain product, then... I will experience this thing, or I will look this way, or I will feel this way. Ideally, it's associated with an emotion, but it, it may be more, um, I guess, tangible or rational. <clears throat> the other thing that, that you made me think about, I guess, is, is how word of mouth works that way. So you were talking about consumption experience is a story, and, well, word of mouth is often regarding consumption experiences, right? And there we go. That's right. That's why we're, one of the reasons why word of mouth is so powerful. You know, you're making me think of something. Um, uh, going back to a, a little bit earlier in the conversation, what's interesting is what a story includes and what it leaves out, what it doesn't say. It may not say some message that you want to convey, and what you need to do is to get the audience for your your story to fill it in themselves. There's a, a great example of this, and this is a real experiment. If you were shown a video of two cars banging into each other at a street in intersection, and I asked you to 
describe what happened at this accident site, you may not mention a lot of broken glass, if I use the word accident. But if I use the word crash, showing you the exact same film, you're going to recall the story as having a lot of broken glass. So the word accident and crash activate or suppress the presence or absence of, of, of glass. Um, so you have to decide whether you want people to picture gla broken glass or not in your communication. Right, whether you're, whether you're an author, you're writing a novel, or whether you're writing a script for an ad, it's a little bit scary. And, and to be honest, I think I told you this in an email after I read your book. I said, after I was about a third of the way through, I felt a little bit overwhelmed and helpless because there's all of these dynamics that are going on, things like priming, things like metaphors that typically we're not aware of. And then I thought, no, I think that's Jerry's whole point of writing the book, which is we need to be more aware of these things. Exactly. That, that's, I, 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 I would underscore that. I, that's exactly why I was writing one of the, one of the powerful reasons I was decided to turn the material into a book. So you were hoping that readers would feel discomfort and then feel empowered. That's how I would describe it. I think I was. Yes. You've got it. You've been able to identify a mechanism that might be used in your best interest or just the opposite against your best interest. But you need to be able to identify the mechanism, such as the deliberate use of the word crash and all the imagery that goes along with it. You mentioned in the book, lawyers do this in the court when they're questioning people on the stand, right? The way they ask a question is interpreted not only by the witness, but by jurors in different ways. So lawyers often are experts in this. Right. Yep. So back to marketing and storytelling. I'm curious off the top of your head, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you think about this stuff. What are some examples of brands that you think do a great job of storytelling? I think... Uh... A number of brands really do uh, a, a great job. I think um, we see it a lot in the soft drink area. I've already touched on that. I think Nike does a great job with storytelling. One thing that I would identify is that they are categories and brands that typically evoke emotion. Every product attribute can ultimately be connected to an emotion. The easier you make it to connect, for a consumer to connect an emotion with a, a product quality, product attribute, the more effective your story. One of the problems is that managers too often tell a story that it is focused on the attribute and they ignore, perhaps because they don't fully grasp what the relevant emotion is or they don't think that's sufficiently important because they're competing with uh on, on attribute fun uh characteristics just in their defense they're also often being evaluated on that so you know they'll have an internal market research department that's literally testing whether consumers understand that they are for example, the most refreshing or the best tasting or whatever, they're not typically right. evaluated on whether they are encouraging or evoking those emotions, right? That's correct. Um, because you can quantify those more readily. Yeah. What gets measured gets done. Yeah. So you mentioned Nike as a company that does a great job of storytelling, and I absolutely agree. And I was hoping to get some of your comments in terms of Nike's brand story and the Kaepernick story. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that was a great choice for them. Why is that? I think they went to someone who is a hero to many people who were purchases of the Nike products, who was showing the strength of taking a position 
of being downtrodden by, by the league, the owners, the public, you know, various political leaders, so that certainly many people who aspire to greatness experience deflation, experience, at, at, you know, adversity and, and may not succeed. And so he was a great example of someone that they could identify with. And to equate that with the product, I thought was was really quite brilliant. I agree 100% for the reasons that you said and, and others. I think that the Nike story is about heroes and celebrating the heroes that we all know. If you look at the conflict that Kaepernick has is experiencing, it's man against society or man against man, <laughs> but he has strength in his convictions and he certainly fulfills the hero archetype to a T. So from a, a brand equity perspective, it was absolutely brilliant. And maybe even not brilliant, maybe it was just so obvious it had to happen. In one of your books, How Customers Think, you list seven archetypes or images. And something that you mentioned um, just in a list of the types of archetypes was that one of them is a woman and the female or woman archetype is typically personified in one of three ways, nurturer, witch, or prostitute. And I thought, yowza. <laughs> and I started thinking about what's going on in our culture. Is there an opportunity for archetypes to change? Because I feel like archetypes are very, very ingrained. And we talked at the beginning of the of the of this interview about the best stories are the ones that challenge us in terms of what we already know. And I guess my real question is, can the woman archetype, which is typically nurture, witch, or prostitute, become something more like the female version of a hero? I think, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that there's a new archetype. I think people are going to see women, in a, in a sense, how they've always been seen, but that's not quite correct. This is an example of <clears throat> sketching my thinking out a little bit and erasing some. But let let's uh, let's let me continue with that. Let's back up. Uh, archetype is um, it's sort of a a personality, and what matters is not so much what the personality is, a hero, a nurturer, witch, prostitute, whatever. It, it, that's not irrelevant, I'm not saying that. But what really matters is the frame of mind, the way of thinking that a particular personality type exhibits. And so we have to be careful not to confuse personality with a way of thinking. I see the changes taking place with regard to Me Too and other activities more in terms of the change in uh, deep metaphors. And the deep metaphors are basic frames of thinking that any archetype might enact or, or possess rather. What I see happening is some uh, progression on the hero dimension away from the, the, the hapless victim. But what I see especially is the frame of transformation and control becoming more prominent, whether it's a prostitute or a nurturer or a witch or, or hero or magician, you know. And that's what I see, and, and that's what I'm encouraged to see happening with regard to the treatment of women generally, is there's a transformation from an unequal to an equal. There's a transformation involving another deep metaphor, which is going from a relative lack of control to greater control. Or lack of power to... A lack of power, that's, what, that's right. So there's degrees, it's not like as if transformation has been fully realized or total power has been achieved, but there's movement in that direction. And I think that's been especially prominent just recently.
so I'd be looking less at archetypes and more at at basic frames of mind, which are often captured by the uh, deep metaphors. So, and but the metaphors that are in our minds can also be more easily retrieved or accessible if they're more commonly told in society, right? I wish that we could just go on and on. I'm wondering if there's any anything else that you want to share with listeners about storytelling or about anything else. I, I, I believe you're, you're absolutely correct in highlighting the importance of story. That's how we live our lives. That's how we understand the world around us. That's what a theory is. That's what a, an explanation is. That's what a relationship is. And I, I think the more you focus on storytelling, the, the more, more service you'll be doing your audiences. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead then with the five rapid fire questions. My first right. question is, what are your pet peeves? I go through cycles on these. My current pet peeves have to do with the fake news and truth decay and letting opinion uh, be the arbiter of what's a fact. Well, I love that you've done something to combat that pet peeve. Yeah. My second question is, what type of learner do you think you are? Visual, auditory, or something else? Uh, If I had to choose, I guess I'd say more visual. It's not not an accident that I, I use a lot of visual imagery in my different investigations and in your books i've noticed and there in my are books, definitely yep. more images in your books than there are in other books that are maybe targeting the same audience and, and for yeah. similar purposes that's true third question are you an introvert or an extrovert oh goodness um can i just be a vert i don't know um <laughs> I, I, I don't like being pigeonholed it, you know is one or the other it's certainly a continuum, but I find if I ask the question that way, everyone says they're in the middle. They're in the middle? <laughs> well, I'm probably each of those, depending on the context. Uh, number four, what is your communication preference for personal communication? So I'm not talking about sending a formal work email where you have to copy your work partner it's more, you know, if you're making plans for dinner or something more personal, What what's your go-to? If I have a choice, I'll go to uh, in person for all kinds of reasons. There's more um, information that c- gets conveyed through paralinguistic <laughs> dimensions, either by seeing someone's reaction or hearing the tonality of their voice, the hesitation or the certainty in their statement. Um, And as we spoke earlier, I can always correct, uh, more easily correct myself. You know, you'll hear me end up saying, no, no, no. What I really meant was uh, whatever. Just play the devil's advocate on that. You could edit an email. I can edit an email, but it's harder to interpret an email that I'm receiving than it is um, to interpret a conversation in which the very same words were spoken. And in an email, and that would be my next after an in-person interaction, uh, face-to-face interaction, an email, uh, you can, you know, repeat yourself, you can uh, have a chance to reflect on what you've just written. Okay, my last rapid fire question is, is there a podcast, a blog, or an email newsletter that you find yourself recommending often to people? Yes, there is actually, and it's by a colleague of mine whose name is James Four, F-O-R-R. And he does a, a blog called The Z Files, in which he summarizes provocative articles and He samples from a wide variety of disciplines. Um, And so I I find his, of all the blogs I see and encounter, The Z Files by James Four is my favorite. Okay, I will definitely check that out and I'll put a link to it. I'm intrigued. I'm going to check it out right now. Great. Is there anything else you want to add? 
No, this has been just a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm Uh-oh. sorry that I, I don't have more time with you, Jerry. <laughs> How can listeners connect with you if they have questions or they want to ask you something about your most recent book, Unlocked, or one of your other books? Is there a way they can connect with you? Yeah, just email is a good, is a good way. Zaltman at hbs.edu. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Your time and your and your expertise, Jerry. Thank you. Super. Bye now. Okay. Bye. Are you still there? I'm still here. <laughs> Jerry, that was so fun. I miss you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview, and I hope Jerry got you thinking, thinking about storytelling and thinking about your thinking. There are many takeaways that I could highlight, but let me leave you with these three. First. Jerry shared that he has used writing as a way to learn about a topic. He acknowledged that talking may also serve as a way to learn. Sharing stories, opinions, and facts through writing and or talking are both valid modes of discovery. Second, Jerry says that the best storytellers, be they writers or musicians or advertisers or otherwise, are ones that allow a co-participating, a co-authorship, or a co-creation with the reader or the audience. Let your reader fill in the gaps. This is how stories become personally meaningful. Last, and perhaps most importantly, Jerry says that so much of our attention in daily life goes to what we think, and by comparison, we give relatively little attention to how we think. We should challenge ourselves to be conscious of how we think. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. I know your time is valuable. You can learn more about storytelling and much more in the weekly Talk About Talk email newsletter. I hope you'll sign up. This is your opportunity to receive one concise weekly email from me full of exclusive content and highlighting what I think is worth talking about. My goal is to help us all become more effective communicators. Thanks again and talk soon.